Hello, and welcome to the fourth class in the LaRouche Pack class series on what is the new paradigm. My name is Megan Beats, and I'm joined in the studio here by Jason Ross. We're also very happy to be joined by two remote locations. One of them is our teacher for today's class, Maestro John Sigerson. And we're also joined by a live audience in Manhattan. Now, over the past weeks, we've taken an in-depth look at the system of geopolitics, the currently collapsing, dying system of geopolitics, first with Harley Schlanger, who took us on an in-depth look at the history of the policies of geopolitics and their root in the British Empire's desire to continue to rule and control the world. And then we looked with Dennis Small at the real substance, the underlying philosophical outlook, which drives those policies in the outlook on the nature and powers of man. So I would urge everyone, especially those of you who may have registered for the class series recently or might be coming upon this video later in time, make sure you go back and watch those earlier classes and their corresponding discussions because these classes were very much conceived of as a series with a certain development of ideas. Now today, as I said, we're very happy to be joined by John, um, who is the music director of the Schiller Institute and a longtime organizer and collaborator of Lyndon LaRouche, who's gonna turn our discussion to, and I'd like to quote John from the class description, those aspects of human social relations which make it possible for the human species to equip itself intellectually and emotionally to make the universe and ourselves increasingly happy in Leibniz's concept of happiness. We're talking here about the domain of classical aesthetics, that is, the science of beauty and the good. Now I'd like to remind our online audience that um, time permitting after the presentation, we will be able to take your questions. So not only will we have questions from Manhattan, but you can email your questions into classes at larouchepack.com. So without further ado, I will turn it over to John. Hello, uh, I would like to start with music because uh, that's what we're going to be mostly talking about uh, today, but also hearing a lot about. Um, I want to start with a song by Franz Schubert. It's entitled An die Musik. It's a prayer to music. And the words go, you dear, dear art, in how many gray hours as I was ensnared by life's wild dance, have you ignited my heart into warm love? and transported me into a better world. Often, a sigh has flowed from your harp, a sweet harmony from you, has opened up to me the heaven of better times. You dear, dear art, I thank you.
Herzen. Du, heiler Kunst, ich danke dir dafür. Du, holder Kunst, ich danke I wonder if you heard Mozart in that. If not, let me point out something here. Schubert that we just did, it's in the bass line. Let me play it just so you hear that. So you see, this is a part of a dialogue of cultures, a dialogue of, of great minds. Um, and we will be talking a lot more later on about this dialogue. Now, Today, I'm going to guide you to the future renaissance of classical culture, which I'm convinced would not have been possible without Lyndon LaRouche's discoveries concerning the primacy of creativity, not only in human relations, but also in the universe as a whole. I'm going to be taking a back seat to Lyndon LaRouche himself and from various extracts from his many writings and also with video and audio clips. I hope to touch upon the main themes which have occupied him for his entire life, which began in 1922. Now, this is also going to be useful because it's going to allow us to pick up where Dennis Small left off in the previous class, talking about the highly unfortunate uh, David Hume, um, and to discuss, and I want to discuss the pernicious influence of perhaps the most evil philosopher of all time someone who is based on Hume, but did something uh, even worse, uh, namely Immanuel Kant. So uh, Lyndon LaRouche, uh, start, starting in his very youth, in his youth, was uh, preoccupied by these matters of philosophy. And I wanted to uh, uh, read you a quote from his description of the way that he was thinking about this all the way back when he was a teenager. And if you could have the first quote there. The entirety of my intellectual and related development is situated in a, uh, in a project which I conducted between my 12th and 17th years. At 12, I made a listing of the names which I believed then, then to be the most influential English, French, and German philosophers of the 17th and 18th centuries. I selected Bacon, Francis Bacon, Hobbes, Descartes, Locke, Leibniz, Hume, Rousseau, and Kant. I soon despised Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, Hume, and Rousseau. I chose Leibniz as the only truthful thinker of the first, of the list, and I assigned myself the choice of constructing an original defense of Leibniz's monadology against the contrary standpoint of Descartes and Hume. And as I mentioned, the previous classes have discussed a lot about this. So if you haven't heard them, definitely revisit them. It was out of this project, Lurus continues, that my notions of classical principle emerged later during the post-war period. The essential philosophical issue is that Descartes and Kant, like Aristotle earlier, reject the existence of a knowable form of creative reasoning. On this false premise, Kant and the Romantics generally insist that there is no lawful yardstick for aesthetical beauty and no rational aesthetics at all, but rather only the capricious whims of both popular audiences or the current generations of self-esteemed professional artists. 
So the conflict between Leibniz and Kant is forerunner for Richard Wagner's satanic malice against Johann Sebastian Beckmesser Bach. Now, you probably wonder what Beckmesser means. He's a character from Wagner's opera, the, the Meistersinger, singer, which is uh, Wagner, who of course was a notorious anti-Semite, um, uh, set this, this fellow up as a, uh, as a, par as a, uh, a parody or, a, or a, a caricature of a pedantic fool who is in, in, uh, in, uh, who's more interested in, in rules and everything else. And of course, uh, he's slandered as, as a Jew as well. So that's, that, that's Wagner's view, who is Wagner, the view of Wagner, who was a, uh, a hardcore romantic. Um, now, in a conference presentation in July 1985, LaRouche characterized Immanuel Kant as probably the most evil fellow Germany has produced in modern times. More evil than Hitler, because the destruction accomplished by the two is greater on the side of Kant than it was on the side of Hitler. In this, LaRouche was in total agreement with the great German poet, poet and follower of Friedrich Schiller, Heinrich Heine, who in his History of Religion and Philosophy in Germany, which I highly recommend, uh, characterized Kant as the Robespierre of the human spirit. But as Dennis only mentioned last week, but really didn't have time to go into, uh, LaRouche emphasized that to really understand how evil Kant was and is, you need to understand the nature of his break with Hume. Hume, who believed that sense certain everything, that, that you can't know anything except what you touch and feel. And even that you really can't know either. Namely, toward the end of Hume's career, he denied not only cre a creative God, but he also threw out the, basic, ba the basics of human moral conduct opening the way to Jeremy Bentham's defense of pederasty, usury, and every single other uh, uh, private vice, supposedly on the argument that this somehow contributes to the public good, which is ridiculous. Schiller uh, had also tangled with, with these, these people like Hume and Hobbes. Uh, and he had the following thing to say uh, in one of his uh, early essay, in one of his early fragments, um, his early letters. He said, and this is the next quote, have it up there. There we go. Many of our thinkers have made it their business with their mockery to extirpate this divine instinct from the human soul, to efface the Godhead's imprint and to dissipate this energy, this noble enthusiasm into the cold deadening exhalation of a pusillanimous indifference. In their slavish sense of their own denigration, they have entered into league with that dangerous enemy of benevolence, benevolence self-interest, to explain a phenomenon that was too godlike for their narrowed hearts. Out of bold egoism, they have spun their comf comfortless theory and have made their own limitations into the measure of the creator. Degenerate slaves who cry freedom amidst the clang of their chains. Now that is, <laughs> I must say, Schiller, Schiller really hit, it on the, hit the nail on the head right there because he's, he's pointing out that, that both, the, the both sides of this problem that we're re reaching in that uh, going, going through, which is that on the one side, you've got people who say that, that you've got people who say that, that the creator uh, is completely unknowable and so we have to follow the rules. And there are other people who argue on the side that the creator is unknowable. And so therefore anything goes whatsoever. Um, now, the radical utilitarians like Hume and Bentham and so late Hume and Bentham and so forth knew that they had a problem, which is that, that, that they knew that this, this total libertinism couldn't really wash completely through society. And Kant was quite aware of that. He was completely involved in 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 uh in his work with uh w with hume uh and all these all the the british uh radical utilitarians but uh he said well the problem is we need something more universal we need some sturdier structure that would require that would be required to permanently expunge creativity which he called by the way noumena 
a noumena that is something that's completely unknown. Um, it exists. You might know that God exists, but you can't know anything about him at all from humans who could only understand phenomena. And that was, the, that was the big difference that Kant would make in a kind of a prison that he wanted to erect for the human spirit. Uh, so he asserted that human relations, therefore, since you can't know anything in terms of the good or happiness, therefore, all you have to do, the only thing you have in terms of human relations is laws. And as LaRouche mentioned earlier, customs and arbitrary customs that have accreted over time, which of course could be changed at any moment or it's completely arbitrary. So it's the opposite, the complete opposite of Leibniz's idea of the pursuit of happiness. And indeed, in one of his writings, Kant argued that the pur purpose of uh, the state is not to make people happy. It is simply to, in order to follow the laws. That happiness is a purely personal, uh, uh, um, a purely personal affair, and so you can pass people who are happy or unhappy, but it really makes no, no difference in terms of the, the way that society works as a whole or develops, because there really is no development. And I must point out that Kant personally was a, uh, uh, embodied that. He was, he was well known uh, in the town of Königsberg, which, where he lived, that, he, uh, that people could set a watch set their watch by his movements because he would do everything at exactly the same time every day. And he did that for his entire, unfortunately, long life. He would, uh, there was absolutely, he was absolutely committed to no change. So um, let's, let's uh, look at Lynn, Lynn and LaRouche on Kant right now. There we go. Okay. So he said, my most important discoveries in every field to which I have contributed are based upon my successful refutation of the famous Kantian paradox reasserted in Immanuel Kant's critique of judgment. Kant asserted two things of relevance here. First, he insisted that although creative processes responsible for valid fundamental scientific discoveries exist, these processes themselves are beyond all possible human understanding. That I proved to be false. And from that proof developed an approach to intelligible representation of those creative processes, and hence the implicit measurement of technological process, progress as such. Second, on the basis of the first assumption, Kant argued that there were no intelligible criteria of truth or beauty in aesthetics. The toleration which has been gained so generally by all modern irrationalism in matters of art has depended upon German and other acceptance of this thesis on aesthetics advanced by Kant and Friedrich Carl Savigny later. Friedrich Carl Savigny, by the, as a parenthetical, he was a expert in Roman law and he insisted on the in, in, reintroduction or the, the uh, sticking with Roman law in all matters of statecraft. Proceeding to LaRouche, he continues, on, condi on condition that we show that classical fine art depends upon the generating function of the same individual creative mental processes, otherwise responsible for the generation and assimilation of valid fundamental scientific discoveries, and only on condition of that proof are we able to supply general, valid general statements about human nature. Now, since all formal knowledge of science and other matters is only relative subject to future scientific revolutions, the question is posed implicitly to us, well, how can we pretend to know anything? The answer is, in terms of those kinds of thought we associate with simple irrationalism, or even with methods of deductive formalism, we know nothing with certainty, and, and, you, and are usually in more or less grave degree of error in our opinions. How then can we ascribe the authority of even relative certainty to science? What we can demonstrate is the increased per capita power of mankind over nature as a whole through those processes subsumed by the term technological progress. What we can show in this way is that technological progress to such effect is truth. 
I had a nice discussion with Dennis Small at the previous class about the question of whether it is truth or whether it is simply a measure of truth. And we can have some more discussion about that maybe later, but it's a, it's a fun topic to discuss. Um, uh, LaRouche proceeds, this fact locates true knowledge uniquely in the relevant functioning of the creative mental processes by means of which fundamental scientific progress is generated and assimilated. Formal deductive statements are relatively true only to the extent they borrow a shadowy authority from the functioning, not of formal deductive processes, but of creative processes. Now, that was also discussed in previous classes, this question of, of the, a measure of either a measure of truth or actual truth is related to this intention of increases in relative potential population density. I'm not going to go to that into that more, but let me tell you that in my view of music and art, that 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 certainly has always been since I've worked with LaRouche for many years, that's always been my measure for the truthfulness of a work of art and not so much looking at the details of it, but looking at its intention. Even an inferior work of art that uh, may, may be inferior if it's performed with a, with a good intention and uh, an intention oriented towards this, um, it, it, may, it may reach into that area of, of truth. Um, but let, let's go on to Schiller. In his philosophical letters, he's, he's arguing in his own words, but pretty much along the same lines. Um, he says, the universe is a thought of God. After this ideal mental image stepped over into reality, in the newborn world fulfilled its creator's plan. Permit me this anthropomorphic way of putting it. The vocation of all thinking beings is to rediscover within this pre-existing whole the original design, to seek out the rule within the machine, the unity within the composite, the law within the phenomenon. Ah, there's a real attack on Kant right there. And, and to carry the structure backwards to its initial plan. Therefore, for me, there is but one single phenomenon in nature, the noetic essence. In German, that's, uh, he uses the term das denkende Wesen. And this was the best translation I could think of. Uh, the great composite, which we call the world, remains noteworthy to me now solely because it exists in order to indicate to me, symbolically, the manifold expressions of that essence. Everything in me and outside of me is only the hieroglyph of a power with which I share likeness. The laws of nature are the ciphers which the noetic essence assembles in order to make itself comprehensive to the noetic essence, the alphabet by means of which all minds converse with the most perfect mind and amongst themselves. Harmony, truth, order, beauty, excellence give me joy because they shift me into the active condition of their inventor, of their owner, because they betray to me the presence of an empathically reasoning essence, permitting me to adduce my relationship with this essence. So with that, I want to proceed to music. And I want Lynn to speak for himself for a minute. And, uh, and, and physical science. The mistake, this, the most common mistake was made, is the assumption that the sense of sight has a one uh, independent form, and the sense of hearing has another meaning. In point of fact, what we should have recognized a long time ago is that neither sight and have the same kind of fallacy as scientific instruments. And it's only, as I cited the case of Helen Keller, the woman who was born without sight or, or uh, hearing, and how she was able to develop a, a sense of social space 
physical space without sight or hearing. And the, the, so the demonstration is that the human mind is the instrument of knowledge, not the senses. And therefore, the dog sniffing at something may not be the best way to go, uh, to follow the dog in, in, in the way you go. You don't rely upon sense certainty. It's the human mind that's important. And the discovery of, of physical principles is the uh, is an example of that, real physical principles. You take the, for example, the key thing is Galileo, a fraud and a faker. And the influence of Galileo, who was actually sort of a high priest for uh, uh, Paolo Sarapi in developing this crazy system of empiricism, uh, he uses one method. But Kepler uses another method. Kepler's thing, especially on the question of the so-called third law, the, the harmonics, recognizes that there is a different sense organ than either uh, sight or hearing. In expressed in the laws of the universe. It's something which is neither. And that is what he, uh, he, is what he wrestles with in dealing with this question of the organization of the solar system. Oh, we, there are many other aspects of this. Pasteur's work always points in that direction. Vanansky picks up on Pasteur's and related work and points in that direction. Uh, it, from a Riemannian, from the standpoint of Riemannian physics, as opposed to Cartesian thinking, this is rather obvious to one who's been working in the field. But the problem is, is the role of sense certainty, and it shows itself in bad taste in music. The people who like rock music are obviously are incompetent scientists, and I think that's what's wrong with much of our science. <laughs> because if you, if you don't understand that the faculty of hearing is an essential scientific instrument like an experimental instrument, that sight and, and hearing are scientific instruments which come within the box with our body. Hmm? And they're, but they're just instruments of the body. It's the mind of man that makes the discovery. And in the mind of the man, there is no difference between classical culture and there is and science. They're the same thing. One deals with the aspect which looks at it from the standpoint of social relations as such, which is art. And the other looks at it from the standpoint of man's relationship to the physical world on which he acts. Otherwise, it's, it's, the dichotomy is the problem. So, Kepler's Harmony of the Universe is an incredible work, and I highly recommend people work through it. Uh, we have on the LaRouche Pack website, we have an ama amazing amount of material to help people work work through uh, this this totally seminal work because if you if you've thought that Galileo somehow was the person who really discovered the the orbits of the planets and so forth, it, as LaRouche said, it's a total fraud. And Kepler is is the beginning of real science, not just of astronomy, but the, also the science of, of the harmonic organization of the universe as a whole. Uh, it's a beautiful work. I can only mention just a tiny little piece of it to give you a sense of the way he works um, that is completely from the top down through a series of approximations, starting with plane geometry and going to three-dimensional geometry, solid geometry, but then working up into the organization of the entire the entire solar system from the standpoint of music and the musical scale and you've heard the idea of the music of the spheres it's an old idea that was with plato but kepler really worked it through what i want to show is just a first approximation from uh of of this and we have a our first uh uh thing there which he showed the uh he showed a circle and he went and he did, and he worked through the constructability of various polygons within the circle. Uh, so the ones that are constructible, he described as knowable. The ones that you can't uh, uh, construct, such as the heptagon or the seven-sided uh, thing, are not are not knowable. 
in that way. And so he worked out a, a kind of hierarchy and you can see here that you've got the diameter and then the next one, you can see there's a square there. If you can, you can, you can see that. And then there's the square that divides the, the uh, circle into four. And then there's the triangle. Well, there's the triangle that divides it into three also and so forth. And there's the, pen, the pentagon and the hex, hexagon. And these um, uh, define certain uh, relations. And can, can you run that video so you can, it shows how it, um, it, it unwraps? Megan, is that possible to do? Um, I, um, I, I don't have no. that video. I don't have that. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought this was the one that could unwrap. Anyway, if you imagine that you take, take where it says at the top at one, the string, if you take, uh, take the circle as, as if, if it were a, the string of an instrument and you cut it at the top and you unrolled it and you use those same relationships, what you'll get is the relationships along the, along the right side. And I'd like you to just, Megan, if you could just play a couple of those interv intervals, starting maybe with the, well, probably with the one and then start with the one half over, over the next and a couple of the other ones so that people can hear these relationships. Right, that's the one half, right? And, and why don't you play the two thirds? Ah, that's what's musical term, musical relationship, which is known as the fifth. And then why don't you try four fifths? Ah, for those of you who know a little bit about music, you can recognize that as a major third. I don't want to go through all of the intervals, but you can see that these are the, these, and this, this is not, uh, uh, this is not unique with Kepler, but he, uh, he worked. The, the, the question is how you construct a usable, scale that can uh, a singable scale uh, but in a precise scientific way uh, with uh, with with these constructible polygons and you'll see in the next graphic there it is these are on the right side. These are these. Is, this is from Kepler's book, and you have these various relations that he's he's working through in terms of the interrelations of these scales. Why don't you just play the top one, just to get an idea of what that is? Right, right. As you can hear, that's that sounds like a minor arpeggio going down, and he worked this through. Um, now I, and there's a lot more that could be said about this, but what I want to skip to immediately is to a certain kind of paradox that immediately comes up when you start working with the scale, namely that um, in nature, um, especially when you're dealing with 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 the uh, plane plane figures and plane geometry and whole number relationships, there's uh, you uh, these are they're, they're only reflections of what really goes on in nature. As Cusa, uh, Nicholas of Cusa argued, nothing in nature actually is perfectly exact. That is, you can't have an absolutely perfect circle. There's nothing that's so perfect that it couldn't be more perfect in reality. Um, and uh, for, for instance, that's how uh, Nicholas of Cusa, which is way before Kepler, even uh, argued that you could not actually say that there was a perfect that the that the in the solar system that there was a perfect center, that the and that everything was a perfect circle because it would have to be a little bit off. Now he didn't he didn't discover what Kepler did, which was that the or, orbits in, indeed are elliptical to one or lesser degree, but he already had that idea. So. What he's what the argument here is is that is that nothing in the physical world can be absolutely exact. You're always talking about approximations, 
And indeed, what we have to do in the real world is come up with a approximate scale that is able to work with music. And later on, as we'll show with Bach, to work with not just that also can be modulated through various modes of musical modes. The most basic paradox we have, though, is one just to how to tune this scale. And this is something that's that, again, it's uh, I'm just bringing this up as a way of of indicating to non-musicians what what the issues are. So let's take this issue of the Pythagorean comma. If you could bring up the next thing. If we take so we take this interval, which is three over two, which is, as I mentioned before, is the fifth, the musical fifth. I'll just play a musical fifth again here. Although on the piano, it's already a little, it's not actually a perfect fifth. It's a little bit different. But for practical purposes, let's think about that as, as a three over two relation. Now, if I take the lowest C on the piano, and I'll play it here. There it is. And then I take G and proceed, another fifth, another fifth, another fifth to E, another fifth to B, another fifth to F sharp, one to C sharp, G sharp, D sharp, oh boy, A sharp, E sharp, Whoa, that's the top note on the piano. Okay, well, that's B sharp, right? That is E, F, G, A, B. But B sharp, if you look, is, is the same on the piano. That's the same as C on the piano. And indeed, if you take, then you take that and you take it seven octaves down, right? That's seven octaves. They should map, they should map, but they don't. And as you can see pretty intuitively, if you take the 12th power of three over two, you're never gonna get to some multiple of one or one, two, four, you're never gonna get to that. And I just worked out the mathematics here. You see three over, that, that, that you get this fraction 553,441 over 52,488, um, which if you take C as 52, 488 over 52 488 you can see that there's a difference there it's 953 so in other words b b sharp is 953 uh, higher now this is this is known as the platonic com uh the, the pythagorean comma and it was it's been known for a long time there are other kinds of commas depending on how you how you go through you know you can build it on force you can build it on on various intervals and also intervals there you go up and back down but um you're always going to get these kinds of discrepancies. Uh, this, uh, that, that amount, by the way, happens to be in modern measurements where they measure uh, hundreds of a well-tempered or an equal, hundreds of an equal-tempered interval. It works out to 24 cents or 24 one-hundredths of an interval. So the question is, if you want to have a workable scale, you're going to have to find a, some way of chopping that up. And there were all sorts of dis, uh, huge discussions uh, about that, and there still are. But the problem with it is, of course, as we know that 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 the this is still not really on the right level. And Kepler was aware of that because of the sequence that he went through in terms of working these things through. Now, there's another higher order domain that you can look at the whole issue of, and I'd like to um, just um, uh, let's let's look at. Um, well, let's look at the way Bach de dealt with this. Uh, he, he, he did this in his well-tempered clavier in, in, in practice be because in the well-tempered clavier, he has 24 uh, preludes and fugues, each of which is in a different key. That is C sharp, ma C -sharp major, C sharp minor, uh, or C major, C minor, C sharp major, each one going up in their it, it's, it works out to 24. Um, at the beginning though, he showed this frontispiece here, which you see. Um, and uh, you see that sort of curly cue at the top. Um, for many, many years, everybody thought that that was just a kind of an ornament there. It sort of looks nice and so forth. Um, 
But uh, recently there was a musicologist named Bradley Lehman who took a real close look at it and realized that there's something much more interested and maybe there's a method in all of these curlicues up there. And let's look at, look at the next one. He turned it upside down. And if you can see the second to the, uh, from the left, that little curlicue had a little C next to it. And what this is, and each of these curlicues, you can see the one C, G, D, and A, and E have sort of a double loop on it. Whereas the next ones don't have any loop and the next ones have a different kind of loop. And then there's a separate little loop on the uh, to uh, right at the very beginning, all the way to the left, because by the time because from A sharp, then it's another fifth, which is uh, which goes up to back to the F. He starts it on F rather than C, but it's the same cycle. And uh, this is Bach's uh, shorthand for how he adjusted his instruments uh, for uh, being able to play in all of the keys. Now, some people would argue, well, okay. Um, this is still not really equal tempering, and indeed it's not, because um, the equal tempering means that you just say, mathematically, you can write a mathematical function to this, chop up the Pythagorean column and put equal amounts of it in each one. But um, in practice, you can never do that. Um, even if a regular piano tuner knows that you can't uh, tune a piano in perfect octaves, it'll sound terrible. You have to make adjustments in the real world. So these were his kinds of adjustments. Um, now, let's even look at an even higher approach that was suggested by Lyndon LaRouche on the basis of his work with Gauss and Riemann. There we go. Lyndon LaRouche shocked audiences in a, in a conference back in the 1980s when he got up and said, uh, he, we, he, we were expecting him to give a big discussion about the political situation of the time. And instead he said, well, what you have to understand is the way that universe works and everything, the only thing that really exists in the universe is circular action. Uh, okay, circular action. Well, but it's also not just circular action, it's what's called multiply connected circular action. In this graphic, we're simply doing, we're, we're simply uh, twi uh, moving, twisting the, the circular action around itself one way, and we're getting a diameter. And then you're twisting it around another way, and you know we get the center of the circle there. And let's look at the next graphic here, just to get an idea. Circular action, as you can see, doubly self-reflexive circular action, and triply spherical circular circular action if you look at if you work this through and uh you can uh there's a whole different way that you can represent the musical scale go to the next one right this this is take if you see there's a spiral on the cone and this if you work on conical spiral similar self-similar action you actually get various means which approximate uh, the, uh, the, the relationships of the, of, the, of the fifth and the fourth, especially. Go to the next one. Right here you see, again, the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean. And you can see it's generated through this sp uh, spiral action. Next. And you can see here that if you take this spiral action and, and you, you map it onto the, to the, solar, uh, solar, uh, um, the solar system, this is, these are the inner planets, uh, you can get, you've got this very interesting big band um, around the asteroid belt. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of this. This has to do with the way Kepler uh, uh, calculates the uh, the orbits of the the, uh, the ellipticities of the or orbits of the planets um, at their apogee and their perigee, um, but essentially you get a kind of a, a very interesting singularity right at the asteroid asteroid belt, which uh, Kepler was very concerned about. He uh, puzzled it through, uh, but it was really only much later in the in the turn of the 19th century 
that the great mathematician Gauss, um, in working on the a uh, his work on finding the orbit of one of the major asteroids, Ceres, that he realized that the this that the asteroid belt was uniquely uh, located in this area of the F sharp. Um, now, why is that important? Well, it has to do with the fact that in reality, this is a human question as well. The F sharp happens to be the human's basic, human being's basic register shift, a shift of registers. And without saying a lot of that, I would like to uh, to go through, uh, re us, us to read through uh, something that LaRouche says about that um, on uh, a, a work which he called on scientific tuning and beautiful beauty of classical composition, which he wrote in 1988. He said, the classical composer's song reads the poetry with emphasis upon the verb rather than the noun. Emphasizing the, emphasizing the noun suggests an erotic interpretation of the poetry or music rather than the emotions of agape or caritas, which are the natural emotions of the creative mood of concentration. The most singular experience which, uh, which put me on this track in music occurred at the end of the war when I, while I was in India, awaiting the voyage back to the United States and de demobilization. Start from music, I found uh, and His Majesty's voice recording of Wilhelm Furtwängler conducting a Tchaikovsky symphony. For the first time, I heard Tchaikovsky performed as if it were music. It was my first encounter with Furtwängler. It was electrifying. I became obsessed with the desire to discover an intelligible explanation for the difference I had heard. In a more general way, the views, the, uh, in a more general way, the view of the classical song as the Rosetta Stone of music supplied that intelligible explanation. Further along, he says, my thesis on this subject was more or less completed a quarter century later. By 1979, I was exploding with dissatisfaction over my friend's musical investigations. I guess I was among, I was among them <laughs> as well. Um, by 1970, uh, and uh, insisted that we must shift emphasis away from study of the matter of an in, in, in an instrumental context and ground all investigations in the principles of the human voice. It became increasingly obvious to me through fresh investigations of the implications of a beloved old friend of my youth, Mozart's K-475, which I'll play a little bit of it in a second, uh, that the principles of a C-256, i.e. Circ circa A-430 hertz, well-tempered tuning were used in the songs of Mozart and Beethoven as a characteristic voice register passing for a poetic purpose. The same principle is evident in their instrumental compositions. Unless we lower the tuning to the level at which the soprano naturally passes on this value, we compel the singers to misinterpret the works as to ruin their voices by shouting and achieve similar sorts of undesired effects. Okay, we're going to say something about that in a second, but let's go on. I examined myself to the purpose of recognizing more exactly the distinction between those emotional states which foster extended creative concentration span and those of a contrary or indifferent effect. So, I recognized that the emotional cor correlative of creative concentration is a fundamental emotion, contrary in nature to the erotic emotions of lust anxiety, fear, hatreds, and rages. This fundamental emotion is the same identified by the original Greek New Testament as agape, the emotion associated with love of God, love of mankind, love of truth, and love of beauty as classical aesthetical principles define beauty. Once this distinction has been made, I was able to use my recognition of precisely defined emotional states in myself to guide me in isolating those aspects of, of musical compositions which coincided with the strongest resonance of these emotional states. For example, I cannot hear the two opening sections of Mozart's Requiem well performed without experiencing tears of joy. I came thus to understand that the spark of creative genius in a great composer as distinct from mastery of music as a language 
is the composer's acquired confidence in such agapic emotions. It became obvious to me that agape is not merely an emotional state, as emotion is usually defined. The emotion we associate with agape is a form of intelligence and is indeed an integral, inseparable aspect of the quality of reason. It guides us along the upward paths of discovery and related decisions, and so appears to the composer or performer habituated to its joys as a more or less infallible musical instinct. Well, this really brings so many different strands together. Um, I can only go through a, a, some of those strands, but first of all, he mentions Wilhelm Furtwängler. One of the, um, one of the uh, uh, readings or listenings that I assigned was uh, one of the movements of that performance of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, his Pathetique Symphony, uh, that Lenin LaRouche heard in the late 40s. It was actually performed in 1938. Um, and uh, uh, it is, if you compare it to other performances, uh, you will, and, and try to listen to it through Lynn's, Lyndon LaRouche's ears, you will learn a lot about this. Um, the, the other thing that he mentioned is Mozart's 475. Let me just play, I think, did I have a graphic of that? Yeah. Yes, just so you get an idea of this. Okay. Just going to do the very opening. Sorry. Sorry about that. The opening, this, this very beginning right here, is fascinating because it, it deals with so many of the singularities or the, in, in the musical scale from the standpoint of musical registration. This, that F sharp there, is precisely the register shift of the sopranos uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the child's uh, voice. Um, and um, let me, um, uh, and the E flat here is the register shift of the alto's voice. Um, if you, uh, but in the opposite direction. Uh, let's look at this. Uh, this this is material that you might call the C minor series, um, which uh, we'll we'll look at some other pieces in a, in a bit uh, related to this. Let's just look at the way that Bach was looking at exactly this same material. We have the next slide here. Yeah, All right. Because this was part of a theme that that is said to have been given by to Bach by Frederick the Great, but I have my doubts. I think it was there was it may have been given to him already. <laughs> and that um, there was some I can't believe that it was just Frederick that give, gave this 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 theme to Bach to work on. This, this, this scale, that's your soprano to, to soprano register shift, All right. alto register shift. And uh, I think one of the assignments that I gave in the class was to, to listen to the, the three-part Richard Carr that, that Bach wrote on, the, on this basis in the musical offering. So you can go back and listen to uh, work that through. Um, there's, uh, 
the uh, the next part that I'm going to go through uh, play for you is a uh, an interview that we had with that Renee, my wife, and Mindy Pechenik, uh, and I had with Lyndon LaRouche while he was in prison. The uh, I want to get to give you an idea of the all of the different dialogue of the composers that Lyndon LaRouche is thinking about. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that a bit later, but um, I just want to point out that the pieces that he's referencing in this next section are the following, which is he's, he says Opus 111, and he's talking about Beethoven's Piano Sonata, Opus 111. He talks about Mozart's Adagio and Fugue, and indeed that's what it is. It's, and the crucial number is 546, you can look that up. He talks about the K475 fantasy, uh, which I just played a little bit of. He talks about Opus 102, which again is another sonata by Beethoven, but this for a cello. Um, and he talks about the uh, 106, by which he means Beethoven's famous Hummer Clavier sonata, which is the Opus 106. And then he talks about the Brahms, and he mentions, he's talking about Brahms Symphony No. 4. These works are seminal works, which everyone who wants to learn anything about musical ideas uh, should uh, begin to study. But let's listen to Lynn. It's like a test. Can you quote somebody? When you quote somebody, can you quote them confidently? Mm -hmm. You get by what Mendy was doing with this. And then we do go on to Beethoven and the symphonies and to Mozart from Haydn. You take all the C minor and related material and you find out how much they're quoting themselves and quoting each other. Yeah? Because there, there are certain... It's actually the elaboration, just like science, it's the elaboration of a few ideas, keep working on these. And if you look at musical composition, classical composition, as a scientific activity in this dimension, this Aleph domain, then, it make, then you understand it, because it's the science of discovery, of musical discovery, and it's genuine discovery. For example, take, you have, uh, Beethoven did the quotation of Mozart in the form of the 111 which is two quotations of Mozart. It's combining Mozart's, as he did later with the Gosa Fuga, combining Mozart's uh, Adagio Fugue, the Fugue of that, and the, uh, and the 475. Right? It's combined, the two things. Yeah. The two ideas that she's working on, very intensely at that period from 102 on, right? uh, which you're familiar with, the 102. Which yeah, has, that's exactly the that. Xerox with You have exactly that in there, in the, in the uh, Fugal part. Right? This Mozart quotation is in there. Because Mozart's a genius, obviously, was a. He discovered how to, discovered how to do Bach fugues and became a genius at it and instantly within a year. Just became totally absorbed with it. The beta one's fascinated by this business of Mozart really now. Since he knew Bach fugues, but he didn't do it this way, the way yeah. Mozart taught it. So you get that. Now, so in the same way, you get. Is uh, the same effect as the 106. On the center of the 106, it starts with a march, and he gets an idea of doing something with this march, which he redoes as the first movement, and does the uh, last movement. The last movement is the same business, the few movements. Now, then you go to the uh, Adagio Sostenuto, and the Adagio Sostenuto has a, something in it, which is very much related to this two note pattern which you later find in Brahms, in the third and the fourth symphony, the mm -hmm. first movement. A very specific kind of motif for a concept, to reduce everything to pairs of notes, as a, which Beethoven does in the last quartets, by dividing the voices across the instruments, dividing the thematic material across the instruments, which is what you get in good orchestral composition. Don't worry if you don't understand. You didn't follow everything that we referred to here. Uh, we're going to come back to some of these things. I'll just, I just want to, uh, when he's talking about these two note ideas, let me just play just the very opening of the Adagio Sostenuto from, from the uh, Hammer Club here, just so you get just a flavor of it, which is that he's, uh, Beethoven, when he originally composed this, he started it like this. creates an entirely different idea of the entirety of the whole piece. 
it pulls together the unity the unity of the, the of, of that entire composition um, uh, let's though move on to something some other aspects of this I wanted to point out that that we um, uh, in the in the as part of these discussions with LaRouche in the 1980s um, we decided to put out a book which I was the co-author of it's the uh, on tuning in registration for uh, book one many of the discussions that we had with LaRouche were actually about book two which has never been produced maybe one of these days we'll produce it um, but uh, uh, this this book uh, works through the vocal side of this uh, from the standpoint that that the only real resolution to a lot of these problems of musical tuning and so forth cannot be resolved from the standpoint of instruments, that is physical instruments, pianos and so on and so forth, because human the human body and the human voice itself is of a higher order. The human mind or reorganizes the nature of the human mind is actually reorganizes the nature of the way that the human body functions as well. And so that we have these uh, the human voice has register shifts as well. And uh, let's, could we show the couple of figures here? What's the next figure? Yes, right. Just to show, uh, this was, th this idea of registration and beautiful singing actually was, uh, uh, was a product of the, the great Florentine Renaissance. This is Brunelleschi's uh, the cathedral, uh, which was, it's based on the principle of the catenary, which is a non-mathematical curve, and uh, was a major, it was like the moonshot of that period. And, uh, and, but inside of it, as you'll go to the next slide, you'll see that there was a choir stall, which is called the Cantoria, which was done by a, a sculptor, Luca della Robbia, showing singers singing and what's what's fascinating about it and what what a friend of of mr larouche um jose briano a, a singing teacher who uh passed away two years ago uh what noticed something in the way that the, the singers were singing could you put the next slide up he pointed out that by looking at these singers you could actually even figure out which register they're singing in um and also they notice that the way that the singers are singing is with round, very round singing. And this was really the advent of what, what you can call the Florentine bel canto way of singing. Um, it's quite different than uh, older ways of singing. I think the next slide does show something like that. Uh, no, that's, that's simply in the, 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 same, the same idea of there and also the children singing. But you can see the various positions of the mouth and so forth. It's very scientifically worked through. Um, and the next one. Right, this is an older altarpiece. And you can see that these, these, these ladies are singing in a rather different way. You can see they're all they're squunched up through their nose. They're sort of singing as if they have singing through their nose, basically. And with not that kind of bel canto. Um, uh, thing so the, the 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 Florentine way of singing was really a, a complete breakthrough on that. Um, the uh, let's just go through just a little example of this question of tuning. And do we have the next slide? Right. Just here's the uh, uh, just a basic rundown of the way that the registers work for the six basic type of of voices that is soprano, alto contralto and then you have bass tenor and uh, a bass baritone and tenor which I don't think we have um, just to show where the organization of the way that they shift all of the as the music manual uh, explains all of the great composers wrote their 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 poetic interpretations or their 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 music their vocal music from the standpoint but not just the vocal music all their music from the standpoint of these these registers if you work the tuning from the, at, at C256. Go next. Right. This is just to show, I don't want to discuss it too much, the, the problem that if you look where the first, at the, at the right-hand side of the first register, you'll see that at C256, the register shift is between the F and the F sharp, whereas, whereas in the um, 
in the higher tuning, which is in the second line and the, the, the bottom line there, you see that the, the, the shift between the first and the second register doesn't fall, that it falls between the E and the F. So this F is really critical. And this was the reason why we started a campaign, which was signed on by pretty much every great, uh, great opera singer and, and also instrumentalist uh, during the 1980s and early 1990s to get the pitch back to the point where the register shift is, is at the right place. Because otherwise, if you, uh, what it does is it forces a, a strain on the voice when you try to uh, use higher tunings. Let me just demonstrate that for one, just one little piece. Next. This is a, the, from, from Verdi's opera Aida, Celeste Aida, famous opening aria by Radames. And um, uh, it just goes like, I'll do it from here. And it goes right onto that top F. That, that top note there is the F. And if you're singing it, at, at, my piano is tuned at the lower tuning, and so it works just fine, because the question is that top note, how, you, how well you can sing that. I'll try to do this. A celeste aida forma divina works great, absolutely great. If the problem is that if you move it up into the, if you low, higher the uh, tuning, make it higher, um, it doesn't quite work. Next slide. Right. No, is that? Oh, that's wrong. I had the wrong slide. Just leave the, oh, yeah, just leave that one there then for that. Sorry about that. I'm going to play, here's, here's, uh, here's uh, F on my piano, and here's F when it's tuned at A444. Hear the difference? It's not quite a half step, but it's significant. I'll try to sing that same piece, but now in the higher tuning. Let's see. Celeste Aida. Sorry about that. Forma Divina. Essentially, what you have to do is you have to change the, uh, you, 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 uh, you're almost saying that as it's, as if it's an F sharp, and um, or either that or you have to scream it. And uh, so many of the uh, uh, greatest singers uh, realize that this is that this the Larouche really had something here, um, and uh, they joined with him. And um, uh, we had a number of conferences uh, about about this tuning question uh, in the late eight, 1980s, and he was joined by great musical artists such as. Uh, uh, Bergonzi, Cappuccilli, Piero Cappuccilli, Renata Tabaldi. And I'd like you to show you a clip now of one of those, the opening of one of those conferences where, uh, where Lyndon LaRouche uh, speaks and, and describes what he views his role uh, in this is. E infine il signor Lyndon LaRouche, che è l'ospite internazionale e che è l'autore dell'edizione americana di questo libro Canto e Diapason che presentiamo oggi. Allora anch'io chiedo al signor LaRouche, adesso eh, glielo tradurrò in inglese, come si può attraverso questo libro e attraverso questa campagna internazionale dello Schiller Institute cambiare la sensibilità del pubblico in modo che questo problema venga risolto. How can the Schiller Institute and you with this international campaign change the attitude of the music world on this question of tune? Well, it goes to a deeper question that in my position, my specialty is a branch of science called physical economy. È una questione più profonda, la mia specialità è una branca della scienza che si chiama economia fisica. I recognize that, as few have recognized, that the development of music in Europe 
Bach, and especially after Bach, Mozart through Verdi and Brahms, this school of music plays an essential part in the very functioning of a culture. E nel, come nella mia esperienza, anche come economista, mi sono accorto che la cultura europea, in particolare la cultura musicale da Bach fino a Brahms Verdi incluso, ha un ruolo fondamentale per lo sviluppo proprio della creatività. There's a certain relationship to the creative powers of mind which, with this music which does not exist in any other form. E, e questo tipo di musica stimola la creatività umana più di qualunque altra forma d'arte. Right Quindi stiamo rischiando non solo di perdere questa cultura musicale, ma anche la, la civiltà stessa. Ecco perché per me è così urgente mettere per scritto in un certo senso i principi che hanno ispirato questa cultura musicale e a guardare a questi principi che sono noti ai musicisti dal punto di vista della scienza e lo scopo è quello di educare una nuova generazione di insegnanti Now, exactly during this time Linda LaRouche also developed a very close uh, personal uh, friendship with uh, a, one of the, the century's greatest violinists, uh, Norbert Breinin, who was the, who for many, many, I think it was f four decades at least, was the first violinist of the Amadeus Quartet, String Quartet. Um, and um, I'd like, he, nor, in discussions with LaRouche, uh, Norbert Brian, in, along the lines that we're just, we've just been discussing, Norbert Breinin realized that something that he had been thinking about for a long time completely just gelled. And it was this idea of what he calls motive führung, which in, in English is best translated as motivic thorough composition, which we talked about, we referred back a little bit earlier when we talked about the, that, that two note uh, opening of the Adagio Sostenuto of the Opus 106. But let me, uh, uh, to introduce you to Norbert Breinin, who is a wonderful, wonderful person, uh, let me just, uh, let's just run the first part of a uh, series of seminars that he gave um, uh, devoted to this topic. Im September 1995 veranstaltete das Schiller-Institut im slowakischen Schloss Dolna Gruppa ein Seminar mit Norbert Breinin über Motivführung als Schlüssel zum Verständnis der Kompositionsmethode in Beethovens späten Streichquartetten. Ich bin eigentlich hier, um die, um die Motivführung zu veranschaulichen. Und das liegt mir sehr am Herzen. Ich habe das schon lange, trage ich das in mir herum. Und äh, ich hat, äh, es hatte eigentlich nie richtigen Anklang gefunden. Und da, die einzige Person, die das sofort verstanden hat, war Lyndon LaRouche. Und das ist unsere Verbindung. Die heutigen Forscher, die Mozart- und Haydn-Forscher, die verstehen das überhaupt nicht. Sie, be sie, sie Sie bemerken es, also sie, sie, sie wissen, dass es existiert und haben, haben das auch, auch geschrieben. Aber weiter beschäftigen sie sich damit überhaupt nicht. Das Seminar begann mit Beethovens Streichquartett Opus 59 Nummer 2, das dem russischen Grafen Andreas Rasumowski gewidmet ist.
Danke, danke, Simon. Danke. Bitte. Ich möchte jetzt, ich möchte sagen, dass wie das Stück anfängt, ja, mit diesen zwei Akkorden. Das ist das Hauptmotiv der, der ganzen Komposition, ja. Und alles andere, was jetzt, was nachher nachkommt, das das ist eine Variante von Tom, Tim. Bitte spielen Sie das noch einmal. Gut, gut. Und jetzt, gut, das, ja, spielen Sie jetzt weiter, bitte. Ja, ja. ja. Das ist ein etwas, was Beethoven sehr oft macht, eine, ein Halbton rauf oder runter für die Modulation. Das kommt ihm dann sehr zu, zu, zu guten später in der Komposition. Und jetzt, wird, jetzt kommt man wieder zurück durch diese, diesen Akkord, diesen verminderten Akkord und dann ist man wieder in der Haupttonart. Spielen Sie jetzt weiter. Hören Sie das, hören Sie, hören Sie, Tara, das wird, das wird, dieses Tira wird zu einem ganz besonderen Motiv. Aus, aus den Varianten heraus kommen neue Motive zustande, die in der Komposition verwendet werden. Und dieses Tia, das ist sehr wichtig, das kommt oft vor. Bitte spielen Sie noch mal Tira, und dann bitte. Ich spiele sie jetzt hier, da, 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 ich spiele sie einmal das alleine, nur die zwei Tage. Gut, jetzt spielen sie ihre. Gut, ja, das, und da bitte sie auch, ja. Ja, an dem momentan nehmen nur die drei Teile, nicht das Cello, das kommt später. Wie Sie sehen, diese, alle die, die drei. Äh, äh, Varianten vom Anfang, die werden zur gleich gespielt, zur selben Zeit. Die sind alle gleich wichtig. Da ist keine Begleitung oder sowas da drinnen. Und es, es muss alles richtig gesungen werden. <lacht> You'll notice that uh, Dr. Brynan points out that all motivic thorough composition is implicitly polyphonic, right? i.e. With, with the advent of the, the Mozart-Haydn revolution, which occurred uh, during the period of around 1780, 1783, when Mozart uh, just had a, an explosion of discovery because the works of Bach had been brought to him uh, uh, from Berlin. Um, and so he, he hadn't really had exposure to many of them before. Um, that all of the, with this revolution that happened, and also Haydn was involved in this, uh, the shackles of any strict separation between melody and accompaniment, or melody and what were, at that point was called basso continuo, completely thrown off. That, that, um, that therefore also you could have a juxtaposition, but also inversion of thematic elements as well. And this, this kind of a principle of inversion also expands the mind so that you can grasp the principle of the composition and not the specific thing in the principle, in, in, in the composition. And I just want to give one little example here of something which was implicitly part this, even though it was, was earlier, it was uh, by J.S. Bach uh, in 1721, which was a uh, little canon that he composed as a gift to uh, a friend of his, Ludwig Hudemann, 
Can we have that? Yes, here it is. Now, what? Oh, my goodness. What is that? Well, this is what's called a puzzle cannon. And uh, as you can see, it's uh, uh, there are four uh, over at the left. There are like four different clefts, uh, those those little squiggly things. And then something more familiar is a bath cleft. But then also you see all the right upside down uh, four other clefts with then different notes. Well, this was a puzzle that that was not all that difficult to figure out. Um, but there are a couple of different solutions. But the main solution is the one that I will show next, right here. And uh, I had my chorus sing each one of these voices, and then we can put it together. And you can see the way it works. It works on the basis of this rising fourth, right? This, which is the which is really like the motif furong of this whole idea. And this rising fourth is fascinating interval to me has always been because. Keep in mind that the writing, rising fourth is this is is an inversion of, or actually you can think about it the other way around that the that this right going a fifth up that's the inversion of going a fifth down. And that's what this canon is based on, is, is this idea. So why don't you play in sequence, Megan, the, just the four different voices going up, and then play it all together. So On the right side of the original one, you saw all those flats and so forth. And this was, if you look at it, you can, if you turn this thing upside down, you literally can just take the, the sheet and, and flip it over instead of going this, right? That's C major. If you take exactly those intervals, which is a whole step, whole step, half step, whole step. If you go take those exact intervals and you take it going down from C, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, you get, instead of C major, you get F minor. Let's, and uh, for time reasons, uh, why don't we just, uh, just show, show the score and then let's just do it all together rather than the individual voices. Now, of course, the, the original one started with the sopranos, right, going up, right? And now this one, you'll see, 
it's the basis going down and it's so so it's a falling fourth rather than a rising fourth let's just sing have all four do it oh, LaRouche's breakthroughs during this period also, I mean, obviously we did not just extend in the musical, musical domain, but also he was, at, this was happening at the same time when he was uh, proposed the strategic defense initiative and uh, based on new physical principles uh, for the defense, for a mutual defense that would be uh, engaged in by uh, both the United States and jointly with Russia. Um, this was, this was sabotaged by British uh, operations and, and uh, um, which uh, resulted in uh, LaRouche's conviction and jailing. Um, but um, it's, it, and it's very interesting now that, that with uh, Putin's March 1st address, many of the aspects of what LaRouche was initially proposing are now being offered by Russia to the United States. Um, if the, uh, unless the British, the insane British uh, don't uh, uh, prevent that from happening which they're going crazy right now. But um, uh, when LaRouche was thrown into prison, uh, Norbert Breinin, who you heard uh, earlier, jumped to his defense and uh, was doing, uh, and uh, gave a number of benefit concerts for his, for his legal defense. And I'd just like to uh, show you just a little bit of one of those. This was done at uh, Georgetown uh, University in Washington, DC. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, I just want to say a few words. You see, we are here tonight, my friend Mr. Ludwig and I, to pay homage to a great man. We are here to bear witness to his stainless character. To his honesty. I know that all these things will resolve themselves and, and his character will remain as stainless as it is now. But there is another reason why I am here. It is because I'm a friend of the United States of America. I love the United States of America. God bless America.
Now, next, I'm going to play what I consider to be the core um, part of, of this class, which is Lyndon LaRouche's instructions for an entire curriculum, which I think uh, if you want to know where to start with music, this is the place to start. If you can um, work through every single example that LaRouche is uh, about to mention, and this, this was done in, as part of this interview that we had uh, with LaRouche in prison um, in, 1990, in January 1993. Um, uh, I would just say that, uh, point out that, that when we walked into the prison, um, Mr. LaRouche was bubbling with enthusiasm about one of the greatest works, the choral works that's ever been composed, Beethoven's um, uh, Mises Solemnis, his solemn mass, which is a monumental work. And we asked him, we said, Are, do you have, have you been listening to a recording of it or something? And he said, no, no, I don't have a recording. I said, well, I mean, have you been studying the score? He says, no, 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 I've just been working it through in my head. Um, so we were flabbergasted because he knew this piece, this, this uh, Mises Solemnus, and he'd been running it through his, his mind while he was in prison better than any of us who were sitting in the room. I can tell you that. Um, but he, he, in this, this following uh, excerpt, he's, uh, he's going to mention a number of other works, which I just want to list so that then uh, when he mentions them, you'll have some, some reference point. But as I say, this is the kind of thing that you should really go back and listen to many times and work through and figure out exactly what he's, he's talking about in every single one of these cases. He, he mentions Beethoven's Ninth Symphony especially the uh, fugato, which is a fugal section, which is, which is just with the orchestra uh, leading back into the, when the chorus comes in, the fina famous finale of the ninth. He talks about the es Beethoven's Esterhazy Mass, which by which he means Beethoven's Mass in C, which our chorus is just about to uh, perform part of um, in a conference on April 9th. Um, he talks about the Council of Trent, which was a major council in a uh, church council in the Catholic Church uh, between 1545 and 1563, which was one of the most reactionary and stupid councils, which really uh, 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 sealed the division between Catholicism and Protestantism, Protestantism at a point which the church could have actually been unified as some were, were trying to do. Um, he talks about the Beethoven String Quartet, Opus 130. Uh, he again refers to the uh, Opus 106, uh, Hammer Clavier, the Adagio Sostenuto, which uh, I already played you part of. He talks about Brahms's Fourth Symphony, which is which is intimately related to that. Uh, and then um, and then he he mentions the uh, uh, this con works through this concept of motif feudal. Um, so with all of that, let's play this. One of the problems is how do you get to make your pedal point music? And you make it a voice, you know? but it's this spreading. It's, remember, because you're in concerto form, you're in concerto form. You've got an orchestra. At that moment, you've got two voice the voices. You've got the, the violin is carrying a voice, and you're going to mess up. The question is to maintain transparency. And how do you do that? And that's what my criticism is, and thinking this through, and, and also things with this Fagato passage, which leads into the almost day. Huh? And how do you keep that from becoming... Now, they do the same thing with the, in the ninth, the last one of the Ninth Symphony, where the, uh, this Fugato, long Fugato section is used, and they get raucous, and they lose transparency, and because they want, they hate polyphony. They want to eliminate the polyphony. And the characteristic of Beethoven, you see this in, his, in the Esterhazy Mass, the C major, uh, the, again, the polyphony has to be emphasized. Otherwise, you try to make it a romantic interpretation, you ruin it. Then if you play at an elevated pitch, you make everything impossible because you're trying to. And just think about, you know, think about this constantly in passage work. You think of a passage in which there's a register shift indicated for the voice. If you perform and articulate to get the register shift, you achieve transparency by virtue of something happening in that voice. One of the effects of register shift is to make the, uh, give the voice identity. Without, the, without that discontinuity of the register shift, it's hard to get that. Huh? 
I did it with a string instrument. It's when you change a string or change your bowing to get a different register quality in a passage that you get that. You get the voice is now obvious. It has a coherence. Otherwise, it's just a blah. Yeah. So if you want voices to stand out, you have a voice doing something against another voice which is doing something, and another voice which is doing something, which is the polyphonic ideal, which is what the Council of Trent complained against. Okay. No polyphony. Okay. This is only way, this is fun, this is Protestant fundamentalism. We're reading the Bible text to the uninitiated. We want them to understand and chew over the interpretation of each other. <laughs> Of course, which is absurd from the standpoint of the Mass at that time, because the Mass was performed with the music. You had the vocal part of the Mass, the Richard Teeth, and then you had the, the same thing was done as a musical uh, apotheosis of the, of the vocal of Richard Teeth. And everybody knew what the words were, because they had the Richard Teeth. Now they had a, they had a, and the same thing is true here in the, uh, in the case of, of this, in this particular work, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Benedictus. And you look at, you compare the Benedictus there with, with Mozart, with Beethoven, obviously, he's doing with the Benedictus and the Mozart, the Requiem. Completely different treatment of the term, of the word. Poetic treatment is different. It's the opposite. It still has the dotted rhythm, right? but it's different. The emphasis is on dictus, not men. And it makes a completely different composition, which leads that into the art on the stage. And you, you're led to it very nicely by this, this uh, Vogato. leads to it. And you have typical Beethoven, a statement of an inversion of the cradle statement. Hmm? You invert it. Dramatic. Beethoven repeated statement. Typical Beethoven. Or get, they get back to the other business. So you go back from that and you go into the 130, 106. Well, the last movement is all this material double field. Really fascinating. The more you get into it, the more fascinating things there are there. But then go back to the, uh, and then of course you have this two-note pattern, which starts from the first moment, the opening of the first moment, all the way through. It's emphasized by this uh, little uh, uh, improvisation, which precedes the last movement. Then the two notes, which is stuck in as an afterthought to enhance the uh, Adagio Sostenuto. Now, go through the development of the Adagio Sostenuto, and you find the root idea, which is used and quoted by Brahms to create the opening of the Fourth Symphony. You see, it's there already, but it, that is an anticipation of what comes up in the development. And the whole thing is based, in the, the, the 106 is based on these two note patterns. The opening <laughs> statement, right? Forget the thematic statement. Start with Beethoven is late period. You've got to go down to, to elements of this, like the two notes. You got a phrasing, and you got a long idea, but it's composed of these elements. And what he does is he uses these elements, these parts, and he, he plays them against other parts, and he does things, and he echoes them. And, and the interpretation is key on this. You've got to recognize that he's doing this when you perform it, because you've got to make the listener's mind hear it. You've got to make the opening heard when those two notes, are, which are stuck in the beginning of the Adagio Sostenuto, are performed. They've got to hear an echo of the very first two notes that they're hearing in the opening of the first movement. Then you, then you get the way that paired is done in the improvisation to the last, preceding the last movement. It's a pairing of paired notes, which gives you this progression, which defines just the domain. Then the same thing is done in the opening of the fugue itself, the same pattern. And you have to watch these and the differences among them because that is how the musical idea is developing. That gives you this sense of, that's your motif form. Your motif form is reduced to this question of, you see, the problem is if you want to do a really good motif form, you've got a problem. Because you've got, to, you've got to work on three levels, minimum. You've got to work on the level of the thematic material and its pedal point progression. Each piece of thematic material has its own pedal point progression. Now you have a, each movement has its pedal point progression, which is tied to its key tonality. And then all of it has a pedal point progression, which subsumes the pedal point progressions of each of the movements. The pedal point is key when you were composing. The pedal point is the key to the motif for them. Once you've got the pedal points in relationship, all your voices are going to be in nice relationship, because the pedal point serves as, as what an equivalence represents with contour. 
And it works like condors. That's what was so interesting about condor and bone and so forth. They were very, and the fact that he was a violinist and that he, his specialty was the late quartet of Beethoven. <laughs> so these things sort of go together because it's an equivalence. What we're hearing in, the, in this fundamental difference which we get, which to me was obvious with the earlier Mozart, the later Mozart, with the first way it became clear to me. And the obvious, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, this fundamental change which occurred about 1780, 1781 with Mozart, somewhere in there, you know. A big change, which is Beethoven, and Schubert has it, and so forth. They all have this. They call it classical composers, and these romantics don't have it at all. They don't have coherence. You don't have, you cannot hear a piece from beginning to end as if you were hearing a single idea. Hmm? Now you can. And now it's no longer just charming and this and beautiful and this and ideas here and there. But now the whole thing is it has a unity that fascinates you. You want to concentrate on it. You want to shut everything out from begin to end without interruption. You know? It was very simply done by finding this principle of equivalence. But this is difficult. Um, suppose you take a you take a pedal point. If you can reduce a pedal point to a germ of two notes or to a couple of successions of two note germs. It's much easier to compose a motif for them. Yeah. Not only is it easier, but it's the mind of the audience will capture it. Because you're not demanding the greatest elaboration of the audience. It's like Schiller's principle of pleasure in drama. You're taking you have an experience of pleasure, you're reaching the audience for the sense of the level of entertainment. In the simplest way, they grasp it. Now you're leading them through that, through something more. And like the Brahms, just think of the Brahms' first movement, that, that, and the way the whole symphony develops out of the opening of that first movement. And what is it based on? It's based on these two old patterns. Yeah. Because the idea of music lies between the notes, not on the notes, and that's what the lesson is. It's the interval, the succession of intervals, and the relation of the intervals that is the music, not the notes. And the notes are created to define upward, downward, this relative thing, huh? and upward and downward in all kinds of senses. Like the fourth, fifth complementarity, upward, downward, upward, downward. Then the modal composition, like the 132, comes out of the upward, downward, upward, downward. You get two keys up on the basis of upward, down, major, minor, upward, downward. The very, the very simple equivalences which underlie composition. And the trick in perfecting a composition is to reduce an idea to recognize what these equivalences are which make the thing work. And then you get a motif for them. And so, and the problem is, is that is the, the conductors of these using with defective choruses, and you hear a lot of problems with defective choruses. Belcon without bell it doesn't work. They squat. Then the blank voice freaks. They really ruin it. <laughs> oh, they ruin everything. Well, because without the pro bravato quality, you do not get real transparency in a work of any complexity. So your homework assignment is going to be to work through everything that LaRouche just mentioned. Um, the, uh, I just wanted to point out two little aspects of this, um, uh, which is he mentioned the, uh, well, in the last first, which is the Brahms uh, the two notes theme. I just want to play it for you, which you'll recognize. All right. So you can go and listen to the symphony yourself. The other one that he's mentioning is the um, uh, the Benedictus, and just to play the two Benedictus uh, from the from the uh, Mozart Requiem, and then also from the Beethoven Misa Solemnis, just so you hear the difference. Uh, Mozart's is which is not bad, but I mean it's um, it's it's as he said it's more on the bet. Right, so it's Benedictus. So a lot of emphasis on the Benedictus, as opposed to the Beethoven, which is completely different. And as he as he was saying in the opening, it was kind of. The 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 the, the uh, Benedictus in the in the uh, mo in, in the Beethoven is like a concerto because it's for uh, soloist, orchestra, uh, chorus, 
and violin soloist as well. It's 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 an absolutely incredible work. But it starts like this. Benedictus, Benedictus, qui venit in nomine Domini. So that's just, again, that's more study work. Um, we're running out of uh, time. There's more things that I wanted to uh, present, but at, uh, rather than saying much more, what I'd simply like to do is um, uh, mention that, uh, uh, let's see what we can do. No, I, what I'd just like to do is end with music. And Megan, if you could do the, uh, the Kyrie from the Mozart Requiem, uh, which is what we did in uh, at the January 19th, 2014 uh, concert, which was uh, in memory of the life of John F. Kennedy, um, and which was really one of the founding, uh, uh, founding operations of what's now called the Manhattan Project. Um, so if you could play that Kyrie and then we'll end, and I don't think we're gonna have, we probably will not have enough time for questions, so you'll just have to save them up for next week. Thank you very much. Right. Well, it looks like uh, it looks like that's a great note to end on, as they say. Um, this was this was obviously a very full class, and we're very thankful for John for the tremendous amount of material that he was able to cover today. 
for the questions that you have, and I'm sure you've got plenty that were raised by the discussion and the musical examples and the geometric examples and the live musical examples that John just covered, please send those via email to us at classes at larouchepack.com so that we'll be able to have a nice full discussion next week. And watch your email for a homework assignment coming from John Seegerson. You'll be receiving that in your inbox within the next couple of days. And we will see you and discuss your thoughts and questions next Saturday at 2 o'clock. Looking forward to seeing you then.